Usually when we hear the phrase, making an effort, we tend to think of brute force. When it's applied to the meditation, it sounds like sitting for long hours, walking for long hours. And sometimes a long sit can be very instructive. But the real effort, of course, is in the mind. That's something you can do in all your postures, all your activities. And it's good to remember that, because that's where the real effort of the practice is. After all, right effort comes under the section of the Noble Path that's dealing with concentration. And externally, it doesn't look like much at all. Here we are sitting with our eyes closed, not doing much. But there's a lot going on in the mind. On the one hand, you're giving the mind something really simple to do, and that should be easy, you might think, but then the mind makes things very complex. It's if it has scouts, it's sending out in all directions, trying to check out this, check out that, listening to the reports. And we're saying no to those scouts, we're going to stay right here. Notice where you feel the breath as it comes in. When we talk about being with the breath, it's not so much the air coming in and out through the nose. It's the movement of energy in the body. This is especially important as the movement of the air becomes very, very soft. It gets harder and harder to follow. It's very easy to get lost. But if you're with the body, your sense of your hands, sense of your feet, your legs, your arms, your torso, your head, all the parts of the body, that can be very still, and you still feel it. So move your focus there. And ask yourself what kind of breathing would feel good in those parts of the body. You can make a survey, start down around the navel, watch that part of the body for a while, see what kind of breathing feels good there, and then move up the front of the torso, into the head, then down the back, out the legs back at the neck, then down the shoulders, out the arms. Get acquainted with this territory. And then see if you can put all those pieces together, put your awareness of all those pieces together. And the effort lies in maintaining a very precise and continuous focus. In the beginning we hover around the focus as we Try to adjust it. That's what the terms direct to thought and evaluation are all about. Trying to get things just right. And you do need to maintain the sense of the observer, watching what's going on, even as things get very, very still. Because otherwise, as we we're talking about this afternoon, the sense of ease gets very strong, and you just go for it. So that's one of the first lessons you've got to learn. Things can feel good, but you can't go wallowing in the ease. Because the sense of ease comes from being with the breath. And if you drop the breath, then you've abandoned the cause. The ease may continue for a while, but it gets very fuzzy. You can get into a state that's called delusion concentration, where you're sitting here very still, but not really alert. Sometimes when you come out of it, you're not even aware whether you were asleep or not. It's hard to tell. That is not the kind of concentration that leads to discernment. The kind of concentration that leads to discernment has some discipline to it. That might be a good word to think about as you're, as you're meditating. You have to keep the mind disciplined. You can't go off running after your likes and dislikes right now. You have a bigger like that you're working on. In other words, you would like to get the mind to settle down. So thoughts of sensuality come up, you have to say no. Interesting thoughts about your work, interesting thoughts about theories about the world, about politics, you have to say no right now. Your ideas may seem very intelligent, very insightful, but they're not what is wanted right now. You've got to work on this other skill, the skill of being very still. Because there's so much that can be seen when you're still that you can't see when the mind is not still. So you hover around this for a while, and finally gain the confidence that you can just settle in. And then watch out for the voices that say, this is stupid, this is dumb. 
There's not much intelligence going on here. Remember, there are many different kinds of intelligence. The intelligence can, can think clever thoughts and say clever things. That's only one kind. There's another kind of intelligence that thinks strategically. It says, I have a goal. I want to really work toward it. When John Lee talks about the different factors that go into the practice of mindfulness, one of them is ardency, which is basically the same thing as persistence and effort. And for him, that's the insight factor in the mindfulness practice. Now the commentaries say the insight factor is sampajanya, which I translate as alertness, other people translate as clear comprehension. Because the commentary says, well, that's the factor that sees things as in, in constant stressful, not self. Basically applies the, the three characteristics to things. But when the Buddha is explaining mindfulness, he's not saying that at all. When he explains ardency, it's trying to do things well, realizing that there are going to be results that come from what you're doing. And so I make sure those results are good. So it's that pragmatic kind of intelligence that goes into the right effort. You realize this is not something you simply study and think about, read about. It's something you've got to do. You might think about the old classical division of knowledge into two kinds. There's scribe knowledge, which describes things, has names for things. That's a knowledge that comes in definitions. And then there's warrior knowledge. The knowledge that comes from developing a skill and then using it in all kinds of situations, getting really good at it, learning how to apply it, whatever, whatever happens. And we're working on warrior knowledge here. So the wisdom here lies in the persistence and not just sticking at it, but realizing what kind of effort is needed right now. Sometimes the effort needs to be pretty heavy-handed, sometimes it has to be very light. As you zero in on the sensation of the breath, and then just hover around that. And watch out for any little movements that might pull you away. This too is right effort. It's hard to say that right effort is any particular amount of effort. It has to be the effort that's just right for the situation. And John Vu made a comment one time. He said the effort that goes into meditation is not all that much, but you have to make it constant. That's where the real effort is, in the persistence. And because it is an effort in the mind, it's something you can do in all kinds of situations. At the monastery we had construction projects. There were two kinds. There were the ones that would go on for months and months at a time. And there were others that would happen on the spur of the moment. And John Fung would say after the meal, okay, today we're going to do X. He hadn't said anything about doing X to anybody before that. All of a sudden the meal's done, okay, we have to do X, and we wouldn't stop doing it until it was done. And then it wasn't the case, well, you just put your meditation aside while you work. That doesn't work at all. Because sometimes the projects go on for hours. We had one project that started at 8 in the morning and didn't finish until 4 a.m. the next morning. And if you don't have an internal resource to draw on, an internal strength of mind, you get worn out pretty quickly. So this is where you have to remember that the effort of the practice is in the mind. You can be doing physical work and be alert to the breath. Have a sense of your center. If that gets a little blurry, you can start using a meditation word that you repeat to yourself. In terms of the physical effort that's involved, it's not that much. But it is a mental effort that you stick persistently with what you decide you're going to stay focused on. In the beginning it seems to re require more out of you, but you find that you can stay in it for the long term much more easily. So again, the, the wisdom of the effort is lies in seeing maybe what you want to do right now is not what's going to be good for you in the long term. Now, this is a lesson we had to learn as kids, and it doesn't change when you come to the Dharma. Some people like to think, well, when you go to the Dharma, the rules change. 
You can think in non-dualistic thinking. But the Buddha never said anything about not thinking in dualities. I mean, all thinking is in dualities. Even the word, word non-dual implies a duality of, between dual and non-dual. Just got to learn how to choose the right dualities. Number one is, what's the difference between skillful and unskillful? Well, it depends on the result. This is the principle we learn as kids. You do something well, and the results may not happen right away. But when they do come, you'll be glad you did it. Basic Wisdom 101. Then it's one of those things you don't forget. I remember the story one time of a tennis pro's game went into a slump, and he could not figure out what was wrong. He changed his racket, changed his coach, tried all different kinds of things. Finally, after many, many months of trying to figure out the problem, he realized he'd forgotten rule number one when you play tennis was to keep your eye on the ball. So here is keep your eye on the breath, on the sensation of the body here. Whatever sense of energy you feel as the breath comes in, goes out, focus on that. And don't let yourself get waylaid. Any visions that come up in the course of the meditation, you run yourself. We're not here for visions. And John Lee has a good way of dealing with that. He says, if there's a vision you don't like, just breathe deep down into the heart three times and it'll go away. In other words, the visions come because your mindfulness is weak. So by breathing into the heart, you're reestablishing mindfulness. Some people are afraid of visions when they meditate. But it's not the case that genuine concentration is going to bring them on. It's the kind of concentration where you begin to wallow in the sense of ease. Forget the breath. And in those periods where mindfulness is weak, that's when the visions come. So reestablish your mindfulness and they'll go away. So the trick is in maintaining this very refined but continuous awareness. It's like following a wire, and not letting your eyes leave the wire at all, no matter what happens. And then around that wire you can develop a sense of well-being and let that spread to fill the body. But there's got to be that one spot where you stay centered. And don't let there be any jumps or gaps. No matter what. And that's when the effort becomes right. Sometimes it'll require a lot of energy to stay, and sometimes just a little bit. But you apply whatever effort is needed, and you learn how to read the needs of the mind and the body with practice. And if your focus loses track, don't get upset, just reestablish it. Have a very matter-of-fact attitude toward this. And you find that as you develop your discernment as to what is the just right amount of effort, the effort becomes right.